in this section, we're going to be talking about uh, supplies that you and your family and your fellowship will probably want to acquire to help you prepare physically for the Y2K bug. We're going to be covering um, five, uh, very, uh, five very important areas. Your location, that's your shelter, what you call home, water, food, sanitation, and medical uh, uh, things. But we'll also be talking about um, heat, light, and alternative power sources. First of all, uh, all, all of your supplies have to be stored in a place where you can get to them. Someone once told me, well, Kerry, I'm not going to store uh, any extra fuel or water because we have an RV. And so I'm just going to use my RV. And I said, well, that's a fantastic idea. Where's your R RV located? Well, it's up at March Air Force Base, which is 35 miles from our home. And I said, well, how do you intend to get there? Oh, well, we hadn't thought about that. Whatever, whatever you have for uh, preparedness supplies, you have to be able to get to. So for example, you may have some documents. You may have some other things. You may have gold coins. And you may think, well, a safe place to put these is in my safe deposit box in the bank. Well, if the bank is closed for a year, you're not going to be able to get to any of those things that are in a safe deposit box. So make sure that you put all of your supplies somewhere where you can get to them. Some of the items we'll talk about later have to be packed to go. Because there may be events that you don't foresee today, that I don't foresee today, that might force you to evacuate your home unexpectedly and at a moment's notice. Jesus said, when you see these things taking place, don't go back into your home. Run. Flee. And you may be forced to flee before this is all over, too. So some of those things you want to have packed in a, uh, what we call a to-go bag or a go bag. And um, the uh, paper packet that comes along with this presentation has a list of uh, suggested items for your go bag. Treat it as you would a diaper bag. If uh, some of you had babies recently, you know that wherever your baby was, your diaper bag was too. You never went anywhere without your diaper bag if you had your baby with you. Well, treat the go bag in the same way. If you get in the car, the go bag gets in the car. If you're at home, your go bag is at home. Treat it as, as you would a diaper bag. The first most important item, and this is one of the things that will cause you the most mental uh, challenge, is considering your current location. One of the things that this will present, it will definitely evolve to social chaos, lawlessness. And you have to understand what is going to happen in your current location when lawlessness breaks out. If you're in the middle of a city of 10 million people and lawlessness breaks out, as it did here in LA during the LA riots some years ago, what will your response be at that time if you're still living there? If there is no power, if you can't get to extra gas, if you don't have a full tank of gas, if you're not able to get onto an LA freeway where 10 million cars are actually stranded and join the parade, what are you going to do? You need to give this some thought, and you need to think about it right now. You need to go to your Lord Jesus Christ and ask him what he wants you to do. He may be calling you out of your current location. He may not. He may call some out uh, early, and he may call some out late. But ultimately, again, your objective is to obey, not to survive. And you need to hear his calling. The problem is, if you're not listening to his, his voice, and you're not uh, heeding his direction, then it's not going to matter anyway. Okay. You may want to uh, uh, evaluate less densely populated, populated areas. If you do, there may be uh, areas that have water. For example, if you're here in, in the LA Basin, uh, how many uh, properties do you know of that have uh, well water? <laughs> if the water is down for a year, where are you going to get something to drink? It's pretty hard also to store up. I, I will show you later how to store up water, but it's pretty hard to store up uh, a decade's worth of water for a family of four <laughs> in, a, in a small home. Okay, so you're going to have to uh, consider locations uh, with wells. Um, you, you probably obviously want to have uh, wells that have hand pumps as opposed to uh, electric pumps. Okay. If you live in a cold area, this video is going to be going out to northern states. You may want to consider some place that has a uh, warmer winter climate. If you do decide to stay, or if you feel that the uh, Lord is calling you to stay in your current community, just make sure that you are prepared to um, make it through that, uh, that winter. Remember, Y2K is happening in January, um, and you're going to have the normal winter, or perhaps a worse winter than you normally would, and you have to prepare for those type of things. As I said earlier, you may be uh, forced into a position where you have to evacuate unexpectedly on short notice. And perhaps before you've made all your other plans, um, 
If that's the case, then one of the things you may want to consider getting is camping gear. Uh, for one thing, uh, even if uh, you don't end up having to use it for evacuation purposes, your family can always go camping, and that's usually a lot of fun too. Okay, after shelter, the most important thing you need to consider is water. You're not going to live long without it. No one will. You have to understand uh, where to get water, how to treat it, how to store it. And that's what we're going to cover in this, um, in this section. I would like to point out to the video viewers that in the back of the paper pamphlet that comes with this presentation, there are complete, specific, detailed instructions on how to preserve and store water for this event. Okay, so look at that in the back of the um, package. One of the things is that uh, you're going to need one to three, one to two gallons per person per day. And for this event, um, I said here, 55 gallons per person in your family is a very, very minimum amount of water that you're going to want to have on, on hand. A 55 gallon drum of water for each individual in your family. That's basically one month's supply of water. You're going to need more than that. The other thing is, and by the way, this Y2K uh, seminar really came out of an earthquake preparedness seminar that we did for our church uh, that we developed for our church a year ago. And since that time, we've been placing water storage barrels in families um, in our area, the Temecula and Murrieta Valley areas. For the last year, we've placed uh, almost 200 of these 55-gallon water, water barrels. One of the things I tell people is, if you have a family of four and you want to have four barrels, how many did you want to have for your neighbors? Because if your neighbors haven't prepared anything, they're going to be thirsty and you're going to want to be a sheep, not a goat, and have a cup of water for them. Also, how many of your family members live nearby enough that they're going to decide that they're going to move in with you? Okay. So how many gallons of water will you have for your parents or your uh, brothers and sisters when they move in with you? These are things that you need to consider. Family, friends, neighbors. Um, one, one of the things uh, that you may want to uh, think about is you may say, well, I have a pool. So I'm going to just use my pool as my source of water. Don't do this. Okay? The, the um, chemicals that you use in your pool or your spa don't go well with your body. <laughs> uh, so you don't want to rely on those as uh, uh, sources of water. The other thing is that, especially ground pools, they're subject to uh, ground contamination from all kinds of things. And I don't even want to begin to think about what might happen when the sewage systems stop working uh, because of um, lack of power. So don't use uh, pools and spas as a source of water. There's two things that you need to uh, be able to do. One is purify water, and the other is preserve water. Purifying is you have water that you want to drink today, and it doesn't look right. What do you do? You need to be able to purify it for, uh, by uh, either boiling it, uh, adding chemicals like iodine uh, or purifier tablets, or using liquid bleach. There are complete, detailed, specific, everything you ever wanted to know instructions in the back of the packet uh, that tell you exactly what to do to purify cloudy water. In addition to chemical agents, you can also get um, mechanical uh, pumps, and you'll see one of these on the table over here during the break, um, that will also help you with uh, water that appears to be um, murky, cloudy, or contaminated. So uh, those are the things for purifying. Now the second thing is, in addition to purifying, you also want to uh, know what to do to preserve water. Preserving water is you have water today that you want to drink in the future. Pres uh, purifying was, I have water now, I want to drink it now. Preserving is, I have water now, I want to drink it in the future. What do I do? You need to be able to um, correctly treat the water and the container as need be to be able to preserve it. So here's some tips. You need to be able to get yourself some containers for storage purposes, and I recommend that you do not use glass or paper. While we're preparing for Y2K, in the uh, California area in particular, we're still subject to earthquakes. And in fact, as I told you, this seminar actually came out of things that we did for earthquake preparedness. And for earthquake preparedness, you definitely do not want to be using um, paper or glass containers, because they'll, they'll simply uh, leave a mess of your garage or wherever you're storing your water, and they won't benefit you whatsoever. Um, one of the options that you have is looking for uh, things that are called food grade storage containers. And uh, over... Uh, next to the screen, you'll see a 55-gallon food-grade storage container, which is the type of container that we use for our earthquake preparedness. These are containers which have never, ever, ever contained a chemical or a toxin. When you're dealing with plastic, 
it must never have uh, been within 100 miles of a chemical or a toxin. Okay? It, can only, it can either be new or it can have been used one time for food storage. And in fact, that's what that is. That came from a, uh, a flavoring plant where it was used for um, orange flavoring. Okay? Where do you get these? I, I recommend that you uh, turn to a newspaper from your area called The Recycler. Almost all communities have these. And look for, in the recycling ads, food grade storage barrels. It must say that, food grade storage barrels. You can also find these on the internet. You can also find them at uh, preparedness shops. You will pay much, much more for them at those shops. You'll, you'll pay a very small percentage by going through the recycler. The difficulty is that you need to clean them yourself. It's not difficult. It's, uh, it is work. Your dads will uh, love to uh, be part of this <laughs> process. Um, but it's, it's not uh, difficult, and it's not taxing uh, brain-wise, uh, but you just need to do the work. But you'll save yourself a lot of money by doing that. Okay. Uh, anything that you uh, choose for water storage has to have a tight-fitting lid. It must be cleaned properly and sanitized using chlorine. Again, in the back of the notes, you will find specific, detailed, complete instructions, for example, on how to clean a food-grade storage barrel, how to clean it, how to sanitize it, and how to prepare the water for long-term storage. This water will last six months. Every six months, you need to rotate your water. I recommend that when you change your clocks, you change your water. Okay. Again, er er everything you need to know uh, at the uh, detail level is uh, in the back of this uh, paper packet in terms of what to do with water for um, preparing it for storage. Let's talk about the next item. We, we have so far covered Shelter, we've covered water. Next, we need to cover food. Some basic principles, uh, you'll hear this a lot. Store what you eat, eat what you store. And so, uh, for example, if you were preparing for a long-term storage of you know, 10 years, you would want to actually eat what you put in storage and then rotate it after 18 months or two years or something like that. Most of you are not going to actually uh, face that. You might want to consider canned and dried foods. Uh, the canned foods obviously come with their own liquids, which is nice. And they're easy for you because all you have to do is just go to the shelf and, and pick them up. One thing is don't forget to get a manual can opener <laughs> if you go with canned foods. If the power's out, you're not going to be using your uh, power can opener. Um, if the power, when the power goes out, whatever you've got in your refrigerator, eat that first. The uh, freezer that you have uh, will keep some of the foods for up to three days. One of the things that you can do to prevent yourself from opening the freezer often is actually on the outside of your freezer have a list of the contents. So the minute that you open the freezer door, you know what you're going for. Okay, That way you can keep that cold for uh, as long as, as possible. Uh, you have other options. Um, you can select uh, ready-to-eat items that uh, require no cooking or minimal cooking or minimum water. That's a good tip. In your food storage program, don't forget things like vitamins, spices, staples, such as dried milk. Um, in my case, uh, we, we don't want to forget the popcorn. Okay? That's, that's one of the important foods that my family has uh, taken care to, uh, to store. I've identified here for you uh, a mnemonic that will help you remember the four uh, most important food storage issues. The first one is temperature. Your food that you store will degrade rapidly as temperature increases. Basically, every 10 degrees that you can reduce the ambient temperature, you've increased the storage life by two. You've doubled the storage life. So if you have something stored at 100 degrees and you can reduce it to 90 degrees, you've doubled the storage life. If you get it down to 40 degrees, a lot of the food that you have is, is almost impenetrable. Wheat is one of the interesting foods that God has designed for man. Wheat, which is not cracked, I'm not talking about flour, but whole berries, wheat, if properly stored, um, will last thousands of years. They have found edible wheat in the uh, tombs, the uh, pyramids in Egypt. It was stored in a vacuum, airtight container, away from sunlight, away from pests, and it was actually good after 2,000 years. Isn't that interesting? So you need to, uh, need to consider the temperature of your storage location. The second thing is you need to seal off air and, at the same time, humidity. You needed to protect it from pests, um, both human and otherwise. And as soon as you uh, start storing your food and you recognize that your neighbors are wondering, wow, what do you do with all that stuff? Well, <laughs> I'm a Mormon. Um, and the, uh, 
and then you also want to uh, avoid direct sunlight. Su sunlight is one of the things that will deteriorate food very quickly. So this is your mnemonic, TAPS, temperature, air, pests, and sunlight. And uh, I have over on the table one of the devices that's uh, used to avoid all four, at, uh, temperature, air, pests, and sunlight. And it's called a metallized mylar bag. And what you do is you can add uh, properly dried foods into the metallized mylar bag and then you can seal it up with a vacuum sealer. And on the table you'll see uh, a vacuum sealer uh, machine and a couple other devices that are used to suck the air out. And then, just using a regular old iron, you can seal up the metallized mylar bag. What has that done? You've drawn all the air out, so you've taken out air and humidity because the food was properly uh, stored. It's metallized, which means no sunlight can get through. And uh, it does give you some level of temperature protection. Uh, on the floor, you will see a, uh, a bucket. It's a white plastic bucket. It, at least it is when the lights come on. And uh, you will see inside a metallized mylar bag that is filled with uh, rice. It was simply uh, sealed with a, uh, a vacuum attachment to a, a shop vac, uh, sealed with an iron, and then placed inside the white plastic bag for structural rigidity. Okay, that, that makes it easy to stack these things. That, that white plastic bucket, which is, um, I think it's a five gallon bucket, you can get maybe for nothing if you go to your nearby donut shop. Remember, this was used, uh, the bucket was used uh, only for food, and most donut shops have to pay to have these things hauled away. So uh, who knows, they might even pay you to take it. But it certainly won't cost you uh, more than maybe a dollar with the lid. Okay, You can also get these at preparedness stores. You can look over the internet. But uh, that, that's one of the convenient uh, things that you can do for uh, food storage. There are some other tools that you may want to consider purchasing. For example, a food dehydrator. These are very common. You can get them at any uh, uh, household goods store. Food dehydrators are uh, great. You can, uh, you can dry all kinds of uh, foods. We, we uh, dry a lot of fruits and vegetables in our house. And then we use, again, the vacuum sealer to uh, seal out the air. And uh, they'll, they'll keep for a good long time. Um, you can also use the sealer. And then the uh, most popular item that we have up here on the table is a grain mill. This will be interesting. This is an example of a grain mill, which, which formerly had a hopper on it. And uh, the hopper is used, thank you very much. The uh, hopper is used to, um, you pour the wheat, again, whole wheat. You're talking about whole wheat that you would pour into the hopper. You turn the handle. And these are stone, um, stone burrs, and uh, the flour comes out between. Okay, uh, in Y2K, you're, you're probably not going to be able to get uh, milled flour uh, if you can buy anything. You, you won't be able to get flour because it uh, requires uh, quite a lot of uh, power in a big factory to, to create it. So one of the things that you might want to consider is buying whole wheat, and then buying a mill such as this. You, you can get mills in a variety of price ranges, anywhere from thirty dollars up to five hundred dollars. The thing is, you want to make sure that um, they're good when the power goes out. Um, if I could backtrack uh, real quickly, I, I do want to point out two of the tools that you'll want to have for water storage. They're, they're on my table, and I forgot to mention them. If you go with the 55-gallon storage barrels, then uh, you and your wife together, along with the neighbors and everyone else at your church, are not going to be able to pick up that 55-gallon storage barrel and just pour out water to uh, service the needs of your children. It will weigh about 500 pounds when uh, full. And so what you're going to need to do is uh, procure for yourself through a uh, preparedness store or a uh, uh, army surplus one of these. It's a, it's a siphon pump, and it's threaded for use with the 55-gallon storage barrels. And this is what you'll use to get the water out of the barrels once you've stored it there. Each, each of the barrels has two threaded openings on the top. These are called bung nuts. This is called This is a bung wrench. And this is what you would use to actually open um, those threaded openings. Okay, so that's a diversion on water. Other uh, so we've covered uh, dehydrator sealers and mills, and uh, the other thing is, uh, for most of you, I don't want to say most of you, but for some of you, um, cooking is simply a challenge. That if the instructions weren't there for the microwave uh, use, you wouldn't you wouldn't know how to make dinner. And this is going to be a challenge for you. Uh, your families have to figure out, um, are you going to be able to understand how to cook food when there are no microwaves available or when there are no fast food restaurants available? And so I've got a couple of uh, 
uh, cookbooks up here that are specifically designed, they were specifically written for the audience that is cooking uh, under uh, situations of stress and duress. One of them is called, and these are listed in your uh, pamphlet, you don't have to look them up, Cooking with Home Storage, Just Add Water Cookbook, and my favorite, The Wheat for Man Cookbook. This has everything to do about wheat. Uh, unbeknownst to you, perhaps, there are thousands of things you can do with um, wheat that don't require baking, that, that don't uh, produce bread. You, you can uh, cook um, cracked wheat uh, just as you would rice pilaf. Anything that you use rice for, you can use cracked wheat for. It's a, it's a wonderful thing that God has designed. Now, some of you will go out and buy tools and you'll do your own preparations, like the, um, the white bucket, the sealer, the dehydrator, you'll do it yourself. Others of you, you won't be able to do that for one, one reason or another, and you'll want to um, go with a food storage company that prepares uh, dried, dehydrated, or sealed foods specifically for this purpose. And uh, th these are fine. Um, there are some problems, and I want to talk about those with you now. All these companies offer what they call one-year kits. They're great. Some of them are great. Some of them aren't. Everybody offers one-year kits. The only problem is, just as we talked about uh, systems and um, uh, mission-critical systems, uh, everybody defines it differently. So one, one company's one-year kit will be very different from another company's one-year kit. And you have to ask specific questions about what you're getting with, with each company's kit. For example, one company might say, we have a one-year food storage kit, and it only costs $200. And another company says, we have a one-year food storage company, uh, uh, kit and it costs eight hundred dollars. What's the difference? Well, Company B's one-year kit may have supplied three thousand calories per day, and Company A's one-year kit may have been two hundred calories per day. And they they just thought, well, do you need more than two hundred calories per day to survive? We, we thought everybody just lived on two hundred calories per day. We thought you knew you only wanted two hundred calories per day. You have to ask that question: What kind of calorie levels am I going to be getting from your kit? In addition to that, what's my calorie distribution? What percentage is it from protein? What percentage from fat? What percentage from carbohydrates? These, these are questions that you need to think about before buying a one-year kit from any food storage supplier. Okay? The other thing is, what, exactly what kind of goods are you going to be getting? When the lights go out, when the power goes out, when your stove goes out on January 1st, 2000, how many white plastic buckets do you have to open in order to make your first meal? Okay, this, this is a very common mistake. Many, many kits, you might have to open up 11 five-gallon buckets, and these things weigh 50 pounds apiece. You have to think about this stuff. Okay? There are other companies where they say you have to open one bag for your first meal. The only problem is that one bag is the same as the next bag, which is the same as the next bag. In other words, you're going to have 365 days a year of one kind of soup. And you know what? After about the fifth day, you're going to say, I would rather just eat plastic buckets. Okay? <laughs> so uh, you, you need to look at um, the calorie level, you need to look at the variety, and you need to look at um, where the calorie distribution is coming from. Be, be wise when you approach one of these uh, food storage suppliers. Here's another problem, and it's a big one. Uh, this weekend, the 700 Club, uh, Christian Broadcasting Network, CBN, they aired a one-hour program on Y2K preparedness. You may not have seen it, but I can guarantee you millions of Americans did. And one of the things they mentioned was uh, one-year kits and food storage suppliers. What does that mean? Tomorrow morning when you pick up the phone, you may not be able to get through. In fact, last week in preparation for this presentation, I tried to get through to some of my favorite food storage suppliers, and I couldn't. They're very busy right now. Okay. If you want to do this, get on the phones and get your order in. We have people who waited for months and months and months for their orders. People in my fellowship who uh, tried getting their orders through, and it took them months and months before their order came through. Okay? There, there are some very, very good companies out there. It's just that they're very busy right now and things are backing up. I would recommend that you do, that you do everything you can to get a guaranteed delivery date, which is before January 1st, 2000, and that you not pay a cent in advance. So, many, many companies will agree to this, that they will not bill you until shipping. That's what you should expect. Here are um, four companies. There are lots of them out there. I just, uh, I just picked these four. I will tell you that the first one that I named, Walton Feed, um, they have a website. And you see the, uh, 
the address there. This is, in my opinion, the best website on the web in this area. Even if you buy nothing from this company, if you decide that you're not going to buy anything from them, I highly recommend that you get on the web, go to this site, and study. You need to learn about these issues. They have over 400 pages of very, very thoroughly researched information on this website, which address every dimension possible of food storage. You can learn a lot from them, and you never paid them a penny. Okay? If you say, Carrie, I don't have web access, go to your local library. They have web access. You may uh, take a lot of people off staying there too long looking at the Walton Feed site, but you ought to do it nonetheless. Okay? <laughs> get, get over there. The, uh, the next one is called High Country Gourmet, and uh, they are one of the um, innovative suppliers, I think. They have a complete line of soups, which means that you open one bag, and that's your first meal. Again, the difficulty is if you rely only on this type of program, then that means maybe you have a dozen soups to last you a year, and your taste buds will just get tired um, before too long. But it's a, it's a good program overall. Learn how to cook. We have already talked about that. Read books on uh, food independence. I have a catalog that I'll mention here in a few seconds. Uh, you can get books on all kinds of aspects of food independence, uh, some of them that you, you probably have never even heard of, cellaring food. Pickling, butchering, smoking, what have you. Uh, think about gardening. Think about getting some non-hybrid seeds. Uh, non-hybrid seeds means that they will germinate. Um, you, you plant these seeds the first year, and then when you harvest, you take those seeds, and then those become your seeds for the second year. A hybrid seed, it won't pollinate. Whatever you grew won't pollinate. Okay. Another web page that I recommend that you go to that has a lot of information on gardening and food independence is called the ARC Institute. Again, this is in the packet that you, uh, that you picked up here tonight. Uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of pages at this site that help you uh, understand issues on food independence. Okay? So we have covered shelter, location, water, food, and now we're going to talk about first aid. Very good chance that you're not going to be able to get uh, first-rate health care on January 1st, 2000. You need to be in a position to help your family, your friends, your neighbors, those in your fellowship, uh, by providing first aid. You need to develop some skills, and in fact, one of the things that I would recommend that you do is, as a result of this presentation, put it on your calendar to go attend a Red Cross first aid course, or a CPR course, or some other course. Get some skills in this area. The other thing you need to do, in addition to skills, is you need to get some first aid kits. You can either buy these as kits, or you can put them together yourself based on uh, information that you gather through your own research. Uh, I do have some uh, lists in the back of the notes that indicate some things that you would want to have in a typical first aid kit. Obviously, in addition to the kit, you're going to want to have some good first aid manuals. There are, uh, there are some books out on the table uh, that are first aid manuals and first aid kits, some for learning and some for field use. You know, ah, I've got a broken bone. Show me a picture of what I do now. Okay, so you want to do that. Oops. Uh, next item is uh, sanitation supplies. It's going to be very important that uh, you keep everything around your home and neighborhood as uh, sanitary as possible, so as um, you know to take good care of you and your family, but also to uh, keep unwanted pests away. Uh, your, your water and your sewer may be out. You may be forced to uh, do things that you don't have any experience doing. One of the things I recommend is that you get a spare garbage can uh, that you'll use for sanitary purposes. This is very short term, uh, though. You know that, that garbage can isn't going to last for very long. So, uh, depending on your location, you may end up having to uh, dig a trench and bury uh, some of your uh, sanitary things. Bury it uh, packed in deeply. Anyway, you, you need to be uh, prepared to do that. Um, kitchen garbage bags uh, can be used in a dry toilet uh, for collecting waste products and uh, then putting them in the garbage can or burying them. You, you don't want to ever leave these things on the ground, and you need to. Uh, be in a position where you can handle these things effectively. If you do decide to use uh, chemicals, by the way, you need to look at the instructions very carefully and make sure that you're using them with care. You're going to want to uh, procure some sanitary supplies. You don't want to be caught short um, in this area. And so I've listed a number of items, uh, some of which will be familiar to you, some of which we've named before. And I can only say about this slide, don't forget to buy the toilet paper. 
trust me, you do not want to run out of this product. Okay. Um, the next thing is just general tools. Some of you, uh, some of you will have all of these tools already. Some of you won't, and you're going to end up having to go out and buy some additional tools. Remember, you're not going to have police. You're not going to have fire. There's a good chance you won't have 911. If something breaks out, you're going to end up having to take care of it yourself, you and your neighbors. So you want to have some tools uh, to take care of some things. One of the things that, that you'll see up here on the table is in the area of, uh, a tool that you can use in the area of communications is a, a radio. Now, if the power's out, there's not going to be anybody uh, broadcasting much on the radio anyway. And when it does come up, uh, who knows what broadcasting you're going to be hearing. <laughs> it may be uh, stuff from our government that uh, may not help you much. But uh, nonetheless, you can get radios that are actually wind up. I have, I have one up here on the uh, table. It's an AM FM radio, no shortwave on this one. Um, but it's a wind up radio. It only costs $28. It's also solar powered, so if you just leave it on the sun, it'll run. Uh, if you wind it for three minutes, it will run for eight hours. So that's a pretty convenient tool if you want to hear on the uh, AM FM channels what's going on there. Okay. Remember that all the tools that you buy at this point have to be non electric. Uh, they're not going to be too much good to have a cordless drill unless, unless there was no cord to begin with. Um, one of the catalogs that I, that I have up on the table here as an, a display is from a company called Lehman's. It's Lehman's non-electric uh, catalog. It's 160 pages. It is wonderful. Um, I will tell you, just like the food storage suppliers, they have noticed that ever since Senator Bennett began his public uh, testimony, uh, Senate testimony meetings, their businesses has, has skyrocketed. In fact, when I called the operator to request uh, a catalog, I asked her, how's business? And she said, it's just like Christmas. What happened? And I said, well, I think Y2K may have something to do with it. And she said, oh, that's it. So uh, they're going to be uh, swamped. You don't want to delay on getting through to them either. Interesting uh, uh, verse here is Proverbs 8:12. You might want to look it up in a King James Bible. It says, I wisdom dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. Lehman's has many witty inventions, and you want to find out about those. But those are going to be a big help to you, I think. Okay. Uh, there's going to be some things that you want to get for safety and comfort, uh, things that will help you in terms of um, some of the work that you may end up needing to do around your house that maybe you, you never did before because you counted on someone else to be doing it. <coughs> Again, you may not have a fire department. You may. Uh, run into a situation where you'll have to use a fire extinguisher where you never did before. You'll want to get some fire extinguishers. We have some uh, examples up here on the table of fire extinguishers. You want to get the ABC type, and you want to teach your family how to use them. Um, your older children, you and your spouse, want to be able to understand how to use a fire uh, extinguisher properly using the, uh, the acronym PASS. Pull the pin, aim, squeeze, and then sweep from side to side until the fire is completely out. Again. <laughs> Remember to, remember to keep them where you can actually get to them in time of need. Okay, Don't, don't have them uh, out in the garage if it's going to be for a kitchen fire. Have it somewhere near the kitchen. Some of, you, some of you may be interested in alternative power supplies. You need to think very deeply about why you want an alternative power supply. There are advantages. There are also disadvantages. Some of these things are very, very costly. And remember, for most of you, uh, this is not going to be a help to your pocketbook. Preparing for Y2K is going to be financially very difficult for many of you, especially if you're in debt. If you have, uh, like the average American family, $20,000 in credit card debt right now, this is not going to be a picnic for you. So you need to evaluate very carefully every dollar that you spend. So uh, think about whether you really want an alternative electric power supply. I, I do have cards out on the table for one of the local suppliers, which is called Alternative Solar Products. Uh, they're located in Temecula. Their phone number is area code 909-308-2366. 909-308-2366. And I know that their business is really picking up. In fact, they're in the process of fulfilling several very large classified government orders right now. Uh, no one there knows who, who is buying, where it's going, what it's for. All they know is it's a classified government project and the government is spending lots and lots of money on alternative power supplies. Let's, let's hope it's uh, to do good things. 
Obviously, uh, it's going to be the middle of winter. You're going to want to uh, have alternative heating supplies. There's a very good chance that uh, even if you have natural gas, that that natural gas source will go away because it requires pumping. That requires electricity. So don't, don't count on natural gas and certainly don't count on electrical uh, furnaces. Have a wood stove or a fir uh, fireplace or something else if you're in an area that needs heat during the winter, as if you're in a colder area. Understand that fireplaces are very inefficient. Uh, if you're in a winter area that's uh, pretty severe, you may want to consider a wood stove or a kerosene heater. Um, Self-standing wood stoves are much more efficient than fireplaces. This is going to require a lot of wood. <laughs> okay. Another thing you're going to want to consider is alternative cooking sources. For example, uh, propane or gas grills. Uh, you might want to look into, for example, a product that Coleman puts out, which is a dual fuel camp stove which uses the regular Coleman white gas, but it also uses unleaded gas right out of your car, which, which is interesting. You know, if your car is nearby, you're going to be able to uh, have gas, uh, at least for a short time, uh, from, from that source for this dual fuel cook stove. You can also uh, look up on the web, uh, if you're in a sunny location, for solar cookers. And uh, there are many websites that you can go to. I've listed a number of them in the packet, uh, in the back of the uh, packet that you've got. Uh, with this presentation. How about alternative light sources? You can, from the same sources that gave you the wind-up radio, procure wind-up flashlights. Okay? But you can also, uh, through the Lehman's catalog, for example, they have dozens of uh, oil, uh, oil lamps that you can uh, buy. These are, some of them are very, very bright. Uh, and some of them are uh, pretty efficient in terms of their fuel use, you'll want to look into those through uh, Lehman's or some other catalog. Okay. You can also get uh, long duration candles, uh, things of that nature. Don't forget the matches. How about for your cars? You'll need to take some preparedness steps for your cars too. Uh, one of the things I recommend is that you simply get in a habit, if you're not already in it, of keeping your cars very well serviced. Uh, if you have to make an unexpected evacuation, for some unknown reason, you're going to want to have a full tank of gas and all your tires pumped up well. Okay, So just get in the habit of keeping your cars well serviced, keep your tanks full, keep your tires checked. Uh, if it's time you think to uh, rotate your batteries or something else, get that taken care of right away. There, there may be some supplies that you want to get for your cars uh, to prepare for Y2K. For example, uh, you might want to have some uh, Spare cash, an extra flashlight, battery, some tools, a fire extinguisher, a first aid kit. Any of those things are good to have uh, permanently stored in your car. Here, here's an area where you, again, need to take some special thought. Medications. Medications and prescriptions are going to be very difficult to get if the power is out. If all the computers are down, how are they going to verify your prescription? Okay. Pharmacists are going to become very empty very quick after January 1st, 2000. This, this applies to both prescription and non-prescription over-the-counter medications. If you are on a prescription medication, you need to go to your doctor and ask for at least three months extra supply of every medication that you're under prescription for. If he asks you why, tell him exactly why. Because you're concerned about Y2K and your ability to get those uh, life-preserving medications after January 1st of 2000. If he's, if he's not helpful, then perhaps you need to seek out legal ad advice uh, if it needs to go that far and, uh, and actually um, author a letter with the help of legal counsel to that uh, physician and uh, have them co-sign it, guaranteeing to you in writing that you'll have access to those medications uh, after the first. Of course, they won't do that, so they'll probably then write you three months prescription for all the medications as you originally asked. But you need to consider this. The, the other thing you can do in, in addition to uh, medications is make sure that you get your eyeglasses up, updated. E even if you think that uh, that's not so important, get your eyeglasses updated and then keep the other pair around uh, for future use. I will tell you that as an industry worldwide, the medical industry is having very, very difficult times with Y2K. In fact, of all the industries that we studied, uh, the medical industry is probably in the worst shape. 70%, here, here's, here's one case in particular. If you are a diabetic and you use insulin, this will be uh, effective for you. Did you know that 70% of the world's supply of insulin comes from one manufacturing plant in the Netherlands? 
Why is that? Because that one plant is very, very efficient in what they do. Why is that? Because they don't have any people that work there. They only have computers that work there. They work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They never take time off. They never take coffee breaks. These computers run the factory, and they're very, very good at it. At least they will be until 12 o'clock midnight, January 1st of 2000. Every diabetic on the face of this planet is betting that that plant will be effective after that time. They're betting with their lives. If you're a diabetic and you need insulin, you need to approach your doctor and talk to him about getting extra insulin. Okay. One in seven, this, this slide should say in the UK, one in seven hospitals in the UK have already reported that they have no confidence whatsoever in becoming Y2K compliant. They've already said, we, we know we will not be Y2K compliant. All hospitals in the UK, the US, and everywhere else are way behind in fixing the bug. In New Zealand, for example, some of the HMOs there are so threatened by lack of funding, remember we talked about nobody's giving money for this, that they've said they're simply not going to do anything. They'll just wait for failures to occur on January 1st. Here's, an, here's a terrible statistic. Embedded chips, we talked about those earlier, are affecting 50 to 80 percent of all complex medical systems worldwide. Things like pacemakers, defibrillators, all the types of complex medical equipment that you know of in a hospital, 50 to 80 percent of those will be adversely affected by white decay. The sources are there. You can go look them up yourself if you'd like to do that. You'll probably want to complete uh, all your dental checkups um, within the next nine months, I would imagine. You'll, you'll definitely want to get any elective surgeries taken care of in the next nine months. And as I said, Y2K is going to require some planning, and that may also include family planning. Um, if you uh, are thinking about having a, a baby 18 months from now, you may want to re reconsider that with your spouse. How about other items in terms of the uh, supplies area? Obviously, you're going to want to uh, gather and secure copies of all your important documents. Uh, this, this may or may not actually prove useful. It's like the, uh, the insurance by the FDIC and the FSLIC, that insurance doesn't do much good if the bank is closed. These documents won't do much good if your insurance company collapses either. Uh, nevertheless, go through the process of uh, gathering these, good, these uh, documents and then securing them in an area that you can get to, not a safe deposit box. So that, that was a very quick uh, run through of the supplies that you will want to gather in terms of preparing for Y2K. Again, we covered location, we covered food, we covered water, sanitation, tools, and um, alternative heat, lighting, and power. Those are the supply items. Obviously, you'll have more time after the presentation to review the notes and to go back into the packet for specific details. Okay, now let's talk about planning. Your greatest enemy at this point, at least when you came into this presentation, was ignorance. Hopefully you've gained some knowledge and you've overcome ignorance. But your second greatest one is apathy. Believing that it's too late and that there's nothing for you to do. Your third, third largest enemy is procrastination. Saying, well, I'll get to that day after tomorrow, I promise. These are the three enemies that you have to overcome in planning. As somebody said, what's the difference between, in, in uh, preparing for Y2K, what's the difference between ignorance and apathy? And the responder said, I don't know, and I don't care. You need, you need to overcome these two things, I don't know, and I don't care, and you need to take action. Okay. Here's an interesting thing. For you folks who uh, honor the Sabbath, this will be very interesting to you. January 1st, 2000 is a Saturday. That means a Sabbath. The Creator God, the God who created this universe, is going to cause the world to rest one time. Okay? Personally, I don't think that's coincidental. In addition to that, it's going to be a long weekend. Many companies will have Monday off. Um, it will be the middle of winter. There are many places in the country, especially the northern states, where even if it's not Y2Kville, you really don't like to have the winters up there anyway. They're severe. Um, there was uh, extended power outages in the Northeast this winter that lasted for many, many weeks and made many people uncomfortable. The difficulty was that was only in one area of the country and they were able to rely on resources from other parts of the country. What happens when the entire country is affected? You're not going to be able to rely on 
National Guard or anything else from another state because your state is going to be out too. Okay. Now, at the outset of the presentation, we said that there were 537 days left for the world in terms of Y2K. But I said, not for you. 1231.99 is not your problem. I believe that your problem is 1231.98. In other words, while I have spent quite a number of hours preparing for this presentation, you may have less hours to prepare for Y2K than I had in preparing for this presentation. It's just my opinion. And you can take it or you can leave it. But my opinion is you need to be done preparing for Y2K five and a half months from today. Okay? Five and a half months from today, I think you need to be prepared. Records indicate that more than 40% of the companies in the U.S. have already experienced problems with Y2K. They didn't have to wait until January 1st of 2000. They're already experiencing these problems. Many more problems will surface on the 1st of 1999. The 1st of 1999, because that's when many companies will begin 12-month forecasting. How about insurance companies that need to sell 12-month policies? They need, they need to be ready. They'll begin experiencing problems five and a half months from now. How about uh, September 9th of 1999? 9999 is a stop code used by many COBOL programmers. What happens on that day? Will computers crash? Will they give unexpected results? Will they give bad data? Will they corrupt others' data? We don't know. But you can expect that this date and others well before January 1st of 2000 will lead to unexpected results. So what, what, what about you and your family's plan? You need to work together with your spouse. In my opinion, you need to work together with other like-minded families as well. You need to write out, I think, a month-by-month -month plan that goes from now until the end of this year. And I think you need to have weekly meetings, and you need to treat this very seriously, just as you would any meeting at work or at your church. Have weekly reviews with anyone involved in your circle of preparation. Take action items. Hold people accountable. Don't let things slide. Don't procrastinate. Don't put it off. Okay. I will tell you that one of the books that we used in preparing for this presentation is a book called Crash. You'll find it up here on the table. You can order it uh, using information that I've contained uh, in, the, in the notes. It has a very, very good example of month-by-month -month planning that you might be able to uh, copy off of. Okay? You're going to want to involve your kids at some level in your planning. It may be just memory verses, helping your kids understand who is Sovereign Lord, Jesus Christ. Helping them understand what Jesus told them. Fear not, for I am with you. Helping, uh, it just depends on the age of your children. The older children, involve them more thoroughly in what you're doing and uh, in the preparations. Uh, I said here, review every month. You actually need to review every week from now through the end of the year to make sure that you're on plan and that you're taking steps and not procrastinating. In your plan, you need to make sure that you are not relying on any false god, and that you're not relying on anything else but what the Lord Jesus Christ is uh, leading you into. Don't, don't rely on uh, any government agency. Certainly don't rely on uh, insurance policies like the FDIC and the FSLIC. <laughs> uh, don't rely on uh, even your child's school. So your, your planning may involve what about homeschooling. There are things that you may want to learn about your house um, because uh, there may be emergency situations that you'll need to deal with. Uh, you may have to uh, unexpectedly turn off the gas, turn off the power, what have you. You need to know how to do those things. Locate where your, uh, your gas main is and understand how to shut it off. There are tools specifically designed to help you do this, and you'll see one of those wrenches here on the table. Okay, but That conclu concludes this brief section on planning. What I want to do now is zero hour, or in Y2K parlance, zero, zero hour, year 2000. Okay. What are you, you going to actually do when it arrives? Uh, what are you going to do around the home? What are you going to do with your neighbors? Obviously, if you're in an area of freezing in a north, one of the northern states, you need to uh, keep in mind what happens if the uh, pipes freeze. So you're going to want to drain your pipes, protect them. Okay, simple thing. But the most important thing is, what about your church? What about your neighbors? If your neighbors are not prepared, um, maybe because you failed to share this presentation with them or, or uh, discuss with them about Y2K, if they're not prepared, this is going to come as a quite, quite a shock. You need to help 
minister to them. It may be a cup of water. It may be a bowl of oatmeal. It may be a warm blanket. It may be an encouraging word. It may be one of the Bibles that you purchase for them. But you need to work with your uh, neighbors. They're going to have emotional needs, physical needs, spiritual needs. Understand and prepare now, plan now, to help minister to them. In the event that between now and January 1st of 2000, you're forced to evacuate unexpectedly, remember, take your go bags with you. Uh, leave your house locked. If it turns out that your family got separated in the unexpected evacuation, you ought now to agree with your family members a place where you can store a note outside the house that you can tell all the rest of your family members where you've gone. Have a, have a uh, predetermined evacuation spot where other family members will be able to catch up with you. We, we don't know exactly what the future holds. You, you may be forced to evacuate, and you need to plan for that right now. Okay. These, these are just some uh, high-level thoughts on zero, zero hour. You'll, you'll be able to think of others as you meet with your spouse and as you meet with other people in your fellowship who are zealous about planning for Y2K. I want to talk about three special topics very briefly. These are short items, and um, they're controversial items. Self-defense. A lot of people don't want to talk about this. Um, I will only say everyone who lives in Los Angeles or who hasn't been living in a mayonnaise jar for the last 10 years knows that riots break out at the drop of a hat uh, here in Los Angeles, but also in other locations. People are going to be very distraught. This is going to generate lawlessness. You and your family have to decide right now. This is one of the Daniel chapter 3 types of decisions. Remember, remember Daniel's friends, they didn't have to think about this because they had already thought about it. They had a conviction formed. You need to form some convictions and some plans in terms of self-defense. When lawlessness breaks out, what will you and your family do? You cannot wait until January 1st, 2000 and then decide, well, I guess I'm going to buy a firearm today. <laughs> You won't be able to do that. If that's the route that you take, you need to take those things now. Okay. But I will tell you, no matter what you do, as it said here in Proverbs 21, the horse is prepared for battle, but victory belongs to the Lord. You need to prepare, but realize that none of your preparation, none of what you do, eventually, ultimately, is going to result in your deliverance. Only the Lord Jesus Christ will deliver you. Here's your, here's your next special topic. Controversial item number two, your church. It may very well be that the leaders in your church don't even know how to spell Y2K. This is very, this is very likely and it's very serious. One of the problems in our churches is that the leaders in this area are not leading. They may be leading in other areas, but they're not leading in this area. And so you need to help them. You need to help your leaders lead. And one of the things you can do is perhaps provide them a copy of the videotape of this presentation. Provide them the quotes pack. Provide them some of the other materials that you're gathering here today. But help your leaders to lead. Help them to lead your church in getting ready for Y2K. And then uh, work with the leaders to help your church work together as a body. I can assure you, you have a very limited amount of time to get ready. And this will be overwhelming if you try to do it as an individual or even as a family. It will be overwhelming. You need to work together as a body, and you need to divide up tasks and share them among responsible, like-minded people that you know, love, and trust. Okay. Third most controversial item, and here I have to say, do as I say, not as I do. Okay. You're probably going to want to take care of your body better than I have, because this is going to be a stressful event for all of you. This is going to be very difficult. It's going to be very tough. And you are probably going to want to start getting in shape now if you're not in shape now. Okay. I'm convicting myself, so I think I better move on. All right, next steps. What are you going to do when I stop talking? You probably haven't formulated that plan quite yet, but you need to. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about some of the things that you can do after you leave here tonight. Next steps. First one is your own personal Y2K inquiry. Do you believe everything that I've told you tonight? You shouldn't. You shouldn't. Why? Because if you did, then you are not using your own brain. All you did was use my brain. I might have a good brain, 
But you know what? I think the Lord gave you one, too, and he expects you to use it. So you ought to spend some time doing your own inquiry, but not too much time. I've uh, provided here in the packet um, sources for books, cassettes, videotapes, and other things that you can use to do your own Y2K inquiry and assure yourself that what you've heard here tonight is true, accurate, and that you should have uh, a sense of urgency about preparing for Y2K. For example, there were three books that I thought were particularly useful. One is a current bestseller by Ed Jordan. It's uh, available in every major bookstore in the land called Time Bomb 2000. In particular, I encourage you to read the two appendices. They give uh, added detail over what you heard tonight in terms of uh, the nature of the Y2K problem and Appendix B on the interconnectedness of our society. It, it, that's a very frightening appendix, showing you how it is that every one depends on every one for everything. He goes into very many details. The second book is Crash. Uh, from Sunset Research Group. These folks are very uh, responsive. If you uh, pop something in the mail uh, tomorrow, you'll probably get it within five or six days. It's very affordable. You can get five copies, one for you and one for uh, four other families for uh, f just $5 a piece. And there's another book, A Survival Guide for the Year 2000, uh, was uh, third and I think least useful of the books that I uh, used. There's another uh, video which is very, very good, but also very, very expensive. It's um, the video production of a conference that would hel was held at the conference at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS. It was aired on C-SPAN, so it's uh, public domain, which means that if you get a copy, you can make a copy. But for the first copy, it's $90. That's pretty expensive for most people. Alternatively, you can go to the website. Although it is 70 pages, you can print it off for free. It's very, very frightening. In the quotes pack that I provided for this presentation, many of the quotes are from these gentlemen who attended this conference. Men like Ed Yardeni, like Senator Robert Bennett, like Peter DeYeager, like Alan Simpson. These are the, uh, the world's foremost experts on the issues of Y2K. And some of the comments that they make will be very frightening for you, very sobering. One of the things you need to do is, if you watch the video or read the transcript, count how many times you hear the phrase, I don't know. As when Senator Bennett said, people ask me, is the world coming to an end? And I can only say, I don't know. Okay. So that, that's a video. There's also uh, several um, cassettes that you might want to avail yourself of. Any Christian bookstore in the land has a copy of Chuck Misser's Y2K Briefing Pack. It's very thorough in terms of its uh, information on Y2K. There's not a lot there on preparedness. And then also, you can get the complete Art Bell program, of which we aired uh, a few short minutes tonight. It's, uh, it's almost four hours long. Uh, again, it's comparatively expensive, but if you uh, acquire that with uh, several of your uh, fam families in your fellowship, it'll be a little bit more affordable. It's the most popular broadcast that they've ever done in the history of the Art Bell program. Worldwide websites. I highly recommend that you go to the World Wide Web and spend some time investigating this, this topic. There are hundreds and hundreds of pages of very, very well-researched uh, articles on Y2K. Six months ago, there were fewer than five articles being posted per day on this subject. Today, there are more than 40 articles per day on average being posted. And these, again, these are by mainstream uh, uh, media sources, not uh, government conspiracy theory quarterly, right? Uh, Time, Fortune, Forbes, uh, other magazines that all of your family and friends know about that have um, articles on the web. For example, Time Magazine had an article on the 15th of June. It's very good, talking about why the government's machines won't make it. US News and World Report is a very good article, uh, again published in June of this year, that talks about in depth five myths on, that, that are creating Y2K complacency. When you meet with family and friends that say they'll fix it, or we have plenty of time, or some of these other things that you might hear, hand them a copy of this article quickly and tell them to read it. Here are four sites that you can go to that give uh, more information on individual and family preparedness for Y2K. Some of these websites have hundreds of pages of data. Okay, So th those are sources for you, uh, books, video cassettes, audio cassettes, and websites. Spend some time investigating this to assure yourself that what I've said is accurate, but don't spend too much time doing it. Okay, Another thing that you can do in terms of your own preparation, 
in your fellowship, make sure that someone is attending other courses so that they're certified in first aid, CPR, light search and rescue, and some of these other uh, areas. Obviously, you need to begin working on your memory verses, uh, getting your whole family ready. Again, there are memory verses contained in the paper packet that came along with this presentation.